There we go. So I'm going to present uh, what we've termed our physical development framework at Newcastle United Academy. Um, it's a great opportunity to present this to quite a, a wide audience. Um, it's something we've been developing over this last season, um, and there's still a work in progress, but it's a great chance to share certain aspects of that and hopefully get some feedback and questions at the end. So straight away, I'd just like to say it's very much been a team effort pulling this together over this season. Um, might be the one presenting today, but everyone there on the screen has present, uh, contributed towards this development process um, from right from our under nines all the way to the first team. We're trying to get a, a sort of streamlined approach in terms of how we develop players at Newcastle United. So this is just a sort of visual schematic of what the process is we've been through. Um, starting right at the top in terms of the club's vision and mission. Um, then the academy's vision and mission will then lead into that. So that is to try and produce players on a regular basis that can, that can play in our first team. Um, then our sports science department's vision and mission feeds into that. And I'll go into that. And then from there onwards really forms the basis of our framework. And I'll take you through each of these steps. Um, next step down is then our goals and objectives to help us try and meet that vision. And we break that down further into what do we think are the critical success factors that we need to be able to achieve those goals. And then for each of those success factors, how do we measure it? If we're saying it's something important, we need to be able to measure it. Ultimately, then how do we improve it? And then the final step and sort of closing the loops, how do we then measure the impact we're having? And taking us right back up to the top in terms of are we having an impact on our those success factors? Are we meeting our goals and objectives? And are we getting somewhere close to achieving our vision and mission? So in terms of our sports science department, our vision, sort of headed up by Simon Twaddle, our head of Academy of Sports Science, was to deliver world-leading sports science support. Now to try and achieve that, we've set out three sort of mission statements. So the first is around, well, they're all around what I'm going to present today. The first is to what we've been doing this season, try and develop a clear, sustainable and benchmark physical development process. Then within that, within the framework, we highlight what we think are our key physical preparation strategies. So what are we doing to try and support our players to realise their physical potential? And then ultimately at the end, the third statement, which to me is the most important, how are we then integrating this framework on a day-to-day -day basis? to try and improve the performance of our players to sort of develop the next generation of Newcastle United players. So to give you a bit more detail of what our framework looks like, following on from our vision and mission, our two goals that we try to set out, we've tried to keep it really simple, simple sort of strap lines that anyone looking at this can understand. So our two goals are to be ready and robust. In terms of ready, we mean that's ready to perform, ready to step up to the next level, ready to step up into the first team ultimately and perform in the Premier League. And the other aspect of that is to develop players who are robust. Can they not just cope with the demands, but can they meet and exceed the demands of the Premier League? So are they robust enough to handle training, handle games, handle you know 40 games a season in the Premier League? The next step down from that then is these critical success factors. Again, we've tried to keep it sort of quite snappy. So we went with three S's, stamina, speed and strength in terms of developing uh, players that are ready to perform. Um, and then on the other side, we feel that improving physical performance is a really key aspect of building robustness. And then ultimately, how do we manage our injury risk on a day-to-day -day basis? So then measuring these, we obviously have a testing battery that we perform a couple of times a season. I'll go into more detail on certain aspects of that later, um, including sort of on-field tests and profiling in the gym. And then in terms of the robustness side, we try and assess non-contact injuries. So that's the real thing we think we can have an impact on in terms of building robustness. Improving these factors then, we'll have integrated practice design. That's how, all, how does all the multidisciplinary team work together to try and design the practice on a day-to-day -day and weekly, weekly basis to improve the players. And then we also have conditioning programs, gym programs. Uh, over on the right-hand side there, injury reduction will be a key part of our managing injury risk and also our training load management and sort of fatigue monitoring with wellness jumps, etc. And then for all of these aspects, key things we're trying to look at is minimum detectable change. So we need to know 
are our measures reliable or what's the level of reliability this idea of signal and noise and then final bit that i'll go on to more towards the end of the presentation is trying to understand what's the practically important changes we need so that idea of in order to make players who are ready to perform in the Premier League, what sort of key performance indicators do we need? So for the purpose of this presentation, I'm going to focus more on the stamina aspect. So I'll go through why we think stamina is important as a critical success factor. The three main sort of components we have in terms of measuring stamina, which is our fitness testing, our match performance and subjective expert opinion. Um, how we improve those, I won't touch too much on this integrated practice design because that could be a whole presentation itself, but then we'll focus more around individ our individualised conditioning programme. And then ultimately some of the research at the end we've done around understanding detectable and practically important changes. So in terms of stamina as a success factor, I'm not going to repeat all the stuff you'll already know around the literature of why stamina is important as a determinant of football performance. Um, you know, the, the 90 minute game, players are covering between 10 and 12 kilometres in a game. All of these things mean that it's um, really is a key thing for that sort of duration, the aerobic capacity. But the more important thing for me is always this idea around if we can improve aerobic capacity or stamina, we're likely going to then mitigate some of the fatigue players see acutely within the game and then speed up that recovery process, possibly post game. Um, so we've got their sort of improving aerobic capacity will reduce these metabolic byproducts within the game that if you're limiting then the anaerobic contribution. Um, we also see in the literature there's a positive relationship between maximum aerobic capacity and physical match performance. Uh, and then at the end I'll show some of our research we've done around reduced fatigue ability following players who have increased stamina, increased aerobic capacity. When we look into the literature around what is stamina, we normally break it down into three, three components, three determinants. We'll probably say that in football, we're not, in football training in particular, we're not really focusing on lactate threshold or running economy, I wouldn't think. We're not really anymore doing the longer steady state runs to improve lactate threshold. And running economy might sometimes be a byproduct of certain aspects of our program, such as trying to improve running mechanics or the work in the gym. But Probably when we talk about conditioning programs in football, we are generally trying to focus around VO2 max um, and how we improve that aspect. So we can break that down further. In the, on the left, you've got oxygen transportation, so that's more of your central adaptations. On the right, oxygen utilisation, so that's more the peripheral adaptation. And we can choose different, um, different sort of drills, different combinations of drills. Uh, work on Martin Bouchette, different weapons, he would call it the target, different aspects of, of this VO2 max improvement. So now how do we try and measure these factors in, at Newcastle United in terms of stamina? So as I mentioned, we have these three different components that we will look at, but that's sort of broken down further in terms of age group specific within the academy. So we will conduct the mass test will assess physical match performance with the teams we have GPS data coverage on. That will be our first team down to under 16s. And then this idea of subjective expert opinion will run right through the academy uh, where we're asking coaches to rate players and I'll show you a bit more on that. First of our mass test, very basic, probably a lot of you have done something similar, similar in the past. We've sort of designed one of our pitches so that we can cut the corners off to create a 300 meter running track um, so five laps of that will give us our 1500 meter time trial and the time taken to complete that will give us an estimate of maximum aerobic speed. Um, this has been shown to be a good or sort of quite good measure of speed at VO2 max you more laboratory based assessments and shown good validity to that in certain studies. We typically try to do this with the academy players four times a season. So we'd have a pre-season assessment, an end of pre-season or start of the season, and then a mid-season and an end of season assessment as well. This is how it sort of breaks down in terms of benchmarking for our different age groups. So if you think the quicker the speed, the higher your maximum aerobic speed is. So from under 12s down to under 16s, we see some quite large improvements in maximum aerobic speed and then more of a steady improvement from under 16s to under 18s, under 23s. 
we try and then break it down further. So if I use the under 18s as an example, we'll then benchmark our players and try to categorize them based on their percentile rank within our data set. So we look at whether a player is good, excellent, average, below average, or poor, based on these 20 sort of percent bracket categories. So anyone who we class in as excellent would be in the uh, 80th percentile, and they'd have to achieve a time of over uh, under five minutes, nine seconds, so it's 15 minute time trial. So we can then do that for each age group and understand where that player is in terms of their aerobic capacity. The second aspect we will look at is physical match performance. So in terms of match performance, we're assessing that with first team down or under 16s. First team is our stadium tracking system. So the under 23s, under 18s, under 16s will be with the Catapult Sports GPS units. And we now have in the academy probably around six seasons worth of data. And um, that works out at about 1,000 data points per age group. And then if you break that down at position, we've got probably 100 data points per position per age group. So we're starting to build up a good picture across seasons, across different players, across positions, and um, what our typical benchmarks are. In terms of just squads as a whole, you can see if we use total distance per minute as a sort of proxy measure of stamina, um, we see a bit of a jump up from under 16s to under 18s in terms of metres per minute, but then not really much of a difference from under 18s to under 23s to our first team. There is, however, you'll, as you all know, large positional differences. So you can see there what you'd expect. Your centre defence is probably the lowest in terms of distance covered compared to your centre midfielders who will be covering the greatest distances. We'll then break that down further. Similar approach to the mass. So if I use the under 18 as an example for our centre midfielder, we'll try and benchmark this player against the historical data we have for that position. So in terms of his meters, average metres per minute, we can categorise is, is that excellent, good, average, below average, or poor. Now we're not really saying here that running more in a game is better. What we're trying to say is over this quite a longitudinal period of time, five or six seasons, we think we have a good understanding of what the demands are of that, that position and what we want is to give the player the capacity to meet whatever the demands may be. We want the demands to be as low as possible because we're dominating teams technically and tactically, but sometimes we will need that greater capacity to be able to outwork teams in our academy and first team. And finally, this idea of subjective expert opinion. We use this when possibly more objective monitoring tools aren't available, particularly in our younger age groups, or as a sort of added qualitative approach. So we'll ask the, we ask the coaches to come up with some position-specific uh, football actions, which they've um, come up with themselves in terms of terms for each position, what they feel stamina is on the pitch. And the coaches will then rate the players alongside the team sports science. For example, the centre midfielder, that might be something like, can they maintain work rate and influence the game for 90 plus minutes? Can they repeatedly attack and recover box to box? These sort of real, real life on pitch examples of what our coaches think stamina is. And then they will rate the player to back up our sort of objective data that we have or sort of counteract that. So taking all of these three components into consideration, we've come up with this decision chart. So starting at the top, we'll assess is the player's mass at the benchmark, age-specific benchmark we think there needs to be. Is their physical, where's their physical match performance at? And then thirdly, what's that subjective expert opinion telling us? So as an example, this centre midfielder, he's got an excellent maximum aerobic speed. <coughs> he's very good, uh, he's got good physical match performance in terms of metres per minute for his position and the coaches are rating him as excellent as well. So going down the sort of decision chart, yes, 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 we can say that his stamina is very good and we'll try and focus on other areas of physical development. Conversely to that, we might have a player who's an attacking midfielder here who's below average, his match stats are telling us he's poor in terms of his position. And the coaches are also seeing that on the pitch with their assessment. So we definitely want to try and develop stamina in some way. Another example of sometimes what we see is this player's got good and maximum aerobic speed for a fullback. However, his match stats will be saying is below average. And this is where it comes into 
in the play where we're not just always saying running more in a game is better. So our coaches actually rate him as good in terms of stamina on the pitch from what they see. They think he's doing what they want him to do and meeting the demands of the game. So we're quite happy that we know he has the capacity from the mass test. The coaches feel like he's applying that in the game. So we then look to maintain that and develop other areas of performance. Final example, which is another one we sometimes might may see, is someone who has good maximum aerobic speed, runs a lot in a game, so we would classify him as excellent in terms of an attacking midfielder. However, the coach is saying he doesn't meet the required level they think in the game, so he's not taking that capacity and transferring that into a game. So that could lead us down sort of both aspects of this decision chart, but probably what it's telling us is in the bottom right there now that he needs to develop more of his tactical understanding. So he's running around a lot in the game, covering a lot of distance, but the coach is wanting him to do other things with all that capacity. So we probably look physically to develop something else because we know he's very good aerobically, but the coach needs to work with the player as well to develop and understand. And that's a really good example of how all of these three assessments can work together and feed into each other to ultimately come up with, with the training programme for the individual. So now how do we improve this factor of stamina? As I mentioned, integrated practice design probably takes up 90-95% of what we do in training, training program, um, and a very small percentage for certain age groups will be this individualized conditioning program. We tend to see we will use this program from under 15s upwards, so that as you're getting progressing through the academy, we then will then try and supplement your training um, with an individualized conditioning program, whereas with the under, younger age groups, we try more to get what we need in terms of stamina from our training sessions. So um, working with the coaches in terms of practice design, putting constraints on practices to develop stamina or speed or other aspects of their performance. So in terms of our conditioning program, I've tried to summarise sort of the highlights into one slide here. Now we've taken a lot of influence from sort of the work of Martin Bouchette and Paul Larson in terms of going from longer intervals up to sprint intervals where we need to develop speed in a play. Um, typically what we'll see is, I've highlighted there, the sort of longer interval section. This will come more in the sort of return to play aspect in rehab possibly, or this will be more of your games-based approach in training. You know, very rarely will we be running a squad of players doing the classic Helgerud four, four-minute runs, things like that, but that often will come in the earlier stages of rehab. Um, so what we see with the with the train with the team who are training is that we normally put them in there, one of these four groups. So the players that we think need to develop stamina will perform a 30-30 interval protocol, which we found really effective for improving maximal aerobic speed. The other side of that is someone who could be very good in terms of stamina but needs to improve their speed. We'll work on sprint intervals, and I'll show some research later that backs up why we're doing this sort of program. <clears throat> Finally, I just want to mention that at the top, of, if you can see, we've got how we monitor. In terms of stamina, a key thing for us is we'll monitor the time of both maximum aerobic speed through our GPS unit. So we put in uh, an individual threshold for each player into the catapult open field system, and we can then assess the time they spend in training above that threshold. And that's a real key marker for us in terms of monitoring stamina. Something we're now trying to reduce is for this sort of middle ground of stamina and speed, we look at 30% anaerobic speed reserve as a threshold. So that's your maximum aerobic speed plus 30% into your anaerobic speed reserve. So there's a sort of anaerobic threshold. And then the final thing is if we're looking to monitor speed in a player, we'll assess time spent above 90% of maximum sprint speed. So I'll go on now on to some of the research we've done, which sort of backs up why we do what we do and how we've come to the, develop the programme we have. In terms of stamina, we, if you look at the figure on the left, we found there's a really strong relationship between weekly time above mass and changes in stamina. So over a six week period, a few seasons ago, we monitored our players, just looked at the different amounts of time above mass they were producing and we saw this really strong linear relationship. So what, what this model is telling us is that typically, to sort of maintain fitness and um, have no change, we'll need to get around six and a half minutes a week of time above mass. And we can see that we can get that from 
normal sort of typical training and match play. So we might not need to do any conditioning with the players to maintain fitness. We can get that through our games based training program and our playing once a week. However, someone who needs to improve their stamina needs to try and achieve upwards of nine minutes per week. We've tried really hard this season to sort of work with the coaches and get integrated drills where we're trying to work on increasing time above mass in our football drills. However, we found it very difficult. Um, if you think someone's max aerobic speed might be 17 kilometers an hour to to accumulate the amount of time you need working above that threshold in a sort of intermittent games-based activity, it's, it's really hard. So that's where, you know, these 30, 30, 30 on 30 off protocols come in handy and do six runs and get close to that two and a half minutes extra a week you need to get above that nine minutes a week threshold. So if you think of our sort of research model is that once we found a relationship, we then need to go out and test it. So something we did was an intervention study, put players into two groups. One group did sprint intervals, one group did the 30 on 30 off, maximum aerobic speed group. And what we saw was the group that did that achieved around 10 minutes per week time above mass and they got a substantial improvement of around 3% in stamina over that six week period. So that was sort of validating the model that we saw in the previous slide. Conversely to that, the sprint interval group, surprise, surprise, improved their sprint speed. Um, and we did sort of miss a trick in this study in that we weren't at that time monitoring this idea of time above 90%. Um, but that is something we'll be looking to do in the future. So similar to the time above mass, is there a dose response relationship between time above 90% and changes in sprint speed? I think it's becoming more and more apparent in the minute that to improve sprint speed in soccer players, you've just got to sprint fast at 100% and sprint regularly to try and improve that. You know, the technique work and the gym work we do helps a lot, but you've just got to get out on the pitch and sprint fast as much as you can. Just as a little aside in terms of this idea of fatigability, the key thing for me with stamina is that we don't just want players to be fit and run a lot for the sake of it. Improving stamina can have a real important effect on how much fatigue players feel from a given workload. So alongside that study I mentioned with the two interventions, we assess players' fit fatigue response post-training at the start of the intervention and then six weeks later. And what we saw was a clear reduction in the amount of fatigue accumulated um, from a given training session six weeks later in those players who had an improvement in stamina. So improving stamina and then also reduce the amount of fatigue players are seeing for a standardised workload. So we've got there that 3% improvement in stamina we saw. We saw around an 11% reduction in subjective fatigue for that. So on to now, for me, the most interesting part is then how do we measure our impact? How do we see, is our training programme working? Is it helping us achieve our goals? So I've mentioned there again, the sort of, this is a, looks a very linear process, but we're trying to close the loop in terms of going back up the chain once we get to the KPIs at the bottom. Are we improving stamina? Is that then helping us achieve our goals and are we getting some way to achieving our vision and mission? As I mentioned, the first step for us always in terms of any assessment is understanding reliability, um, which for us we use minimum detectable change. So that allows us to understand has a real change occurred or if we're assessing players post an intervention, is that just noise in the test? So if you look at the figure on the left, this is our MDC curve. And we use a threshold of 75% to say that we're happy a real change has occurred. So for this test, that will be around 4.6 seconds. Um, the real key for me to use in this sort of analysis is we're not just publishing the 75% uh, the and saying this is the reliable threshold. You know, practitioners could be happy with, not happy with 75%. They want to be 90% sure that they've got real changes. So then you can select any sort of confidence level you want for your assessment then. And that's the real key to going forward, I think, in, in research and applied practice. The next part then is then understanding, so good, we know what is our threshold in terms of things being detectable, in terms of reliability, but that four, uh, four second improvement might not mean nothing out on the pitch. So we use this term minimum practically important change. 
um, which we got from some of the really good review by Robin Thorpe and Greg Atkinson, um, looking at this idea that they've taken from often used in medicine in terms of what dose of medicine is needed to get an important outcome in terms of whatever that medicine is trying to cure. So similar for us, what change in stamina do we need to get a really practically important change to achieving our goals or something out on the pitch? So an example might be what level of stamina is required to increase the probability of one of our players making a first team debut. Now that might not be put, we might look at the, try and look at the data we have and there's no relationship, but I think we should always be striving to understand these real key things that we're looking at. Like I said, however, this is largely unknown, so that'll be a real key, key area for us developing over the next few years. I'll give you two examples of the process we've been through to try and get along this way of thinking so you can take some examples away with you. From that previous study I mentioned, the intervention study, this was the relationship we saw between improvements in mass and changes in fatigue response. So in that other slide I showed that around that 3% improvement in stamina over on the left here equated to a substantial reduction in fatigue. So we're able to say now, you know, the reliability is telling us we need to see a change of around one and a half percent. But to get a real improvement and sort of reduction in fatigue, we might need double that and a three percent improvement. So that's now telling us three percent might be a practically important change for certain individuals. Conversely, we see a bit of a lower threshold for muscle soreness. So we need to see only a two percent change in stamina to see a reduction in muscle soreness. However, then from possibly a more objective measure, drop jump RSI, we need to see a lot greater improvement in stamina, see a substantial improvement in drop jump RSI following in terms of fatigue monitoring. So following a session, we see a, deep, a decrease in drop jump RSI. To substantially reduce that decrease, we need around a 6% improvement in stamina. Finally, last example, something we've um, conducted a few years ago, based on our testing battery from the ECCP. Um, we try to group all of our tests together to create our academy performance rating, which is a score from zero to 100, based on a whole range of tests to try and give us an overall athletic rating for a player. And we can then look at how our players develop throughout the academy. So we've got the age group averages there for an under nine all the way up to an under 23 player. Something we then looked at is, for our key age groups when we're looking at retain and release in terms of under 12s under 14s under 16s what do the players look like in terms of who we retain and who we release and we saw we tend to retain the players who are physically physically stronger than their, their peers which might be we would like to think is a good thing that then led us on to looking at well can we actually understand in terms of probability then what does different athletic performance ratings mean? So this is an example for our under 16s. We performed a logistic regression model to understand for a given athletic performance rating on this figure on the left, how does your probability of being retained at that level and gaining a scholarship into the full-time program at the academy um, improve as you get a greater performance rating? And that's just some of the model statistics on the right there. It was quite a quite a uh, accurate model in terms of predicting who we should retain and release, purely based on physical performance. So there's an example there, an under 16 player who has an athletic performance rating of 70. This model would say it has around a 69, 39% uh, chance of being retained. However, if we can improve that athletic performance rating through our programs, I've shown you some, some aspects of it today, up to 80, that chance of being retained then improves, uh, increases up the 63%. So for just a 10, 10 unit increase in their athletic performance rating for under 16, we see their chances of being retained go all the way up by 24%. So that really helps us drive our program and we understand then that these small changes in physical performance can have a real improvement in our players' chances of getting to the next stage. I just want to conclude again by showing you this uh, schematic. Hopefully I've been through each step and given you a bit of an understanding of one particular aspect in terms of stamina of the process we've been through. 
And ultimately, the key thing for me is that we've always got to have that vision and mission in mind. So, you know, I really like the story of NASA where you go in and ask the cleaner, what's your job here? And he says to get a man on the moon. You know, we should be able to ask anyone in the academy, what's your job in the academy? And it's to get players in the first team. We all know that each department and each individual have different goals and objectives within that. But our overall goal as the academy is to produce players for the first team. We all always need to have that in mind. Thank you.